Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Cultural Insight. My name's Emma Lahane, I'm one of the Aboriginal Hospital Liaison Officers, so I'm going to present to you today this uh, short piece about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, culture. It will provide you a little bit of history into our culture, but it'll also give you some insight on best cultural safety practices when working with our community. So just give you a bit of background about me, I'm a Yorta Yorta woman of mixed descent, so my Aboriginal heritage comes up, up on the Murray and Goulburn rivers around Echuca, Marutna, Shepparton area. Born and raised here in Ballarat. I have Scottish and Irish heritage, so that's a nice fire remix in there. And so, um, born and raised though in my Aboriginal uh, culture, so that gives me a bit of background to be able to present some of the stuff here today. So here in Australia, there are two groups that are identified as First Australians, and our flags are probably the most iconic symbols that we have. Up in the top left hand corner you have the Aboriginal flag which was created by Harold Thomas, a Northern Territory Indigenous man in the 1970s. He created it to represent red for the land at the bottom, uh, yellow for the sun, the giver of life and black for the people. This flag was first seen in the 1970s on the front lawns of Parliament House when Aboriginal people held a tent embassy to protest for better rights for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our country. We now see it flying out the front of organisations and schools and so forth and we recognise this as a national flag of significance. The Torres Strait Islander flag, it represents the Torres Strait Islander people, which are the five islands that appear above the Cape York of Queensland. Their flag has only been recognised since 1993, but their flag represents green for the land, black for the people, blue for the ocean. The five pointed star represents the five islands and the symbol that surrounds that is the Daenerys, which is a headdress that they wear in uh, ceremonies and rituals and it's made out of woven sticks and white bird feathers and it sits like a helmet on their head and it's quite elaborate um, and it is an iconic symbol for the Torres Strait Islander people. Now the Aboriginal people take the mainland and Tasmania and as I mentioned before the Torres Strait Islander people have the five islands above the Cape York of Queensland. Traditionally, Torres Strait Islander people look more Pacific Islander in their appearance and their culture has a strong Pacific Islander influence, but there is a common denominator in spirituality between Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, hence why both are recognised as First Australians. Now this map here is a map of Australia, but all the different coloured patchworks on this map represent all the different language groups that were here prior to European colonisation. So depending on which archaeologist or anthropologist you speak to, somewhere between 500 to 850 different language groups were here um, prior to Europeans arriving. So as you can see across the landscape, some areas will have larger boundary areas than others and that will depend on the traditional methods of hunting and gathering as to how far they would have to travel to find food and water. The red lines that appear on this map are called song lines and the significance of song lines is that we would travel along these routes to meet with other groups. If we came across a group that we couldn't easily identify, we would start to sing a song that had been passed down to us by our creator gods. If the group coming towards us was singing the same song, then we knew that they were a group that we could sit down and mix with. If they weren't singing the same song, we would cross over and keep going. So when I mention about creator gods, we here are living on Wuthering country and the creator god for this country is Bunjil, the wedge-tailed eagle. My community are Yorta Yorta and our creator god is Bambir, the long-necked turtle. Now the boundary area of each language group is designated through the dreaming stories of the creator god. And the creator god's uh, boundary areas comes in the form of rivers, streams, mountain ranges, tree lines and so forth and it was designated out based on amount of people and obviously as I mentioned before the need for hunting and gathering. Now we didn't all mix with each other, we had specific groups that we mixed with across the nation so I know that my community have connections to people in the northeast of Queensland, in the Kimberley, in the southwest of WA and in South Australia. 
And the main purpose of mixing with these groups were for sporting carnivals, but also to exchange ideas on hunting and gathering techniques and making weapons and tools. But the main purpose was for marriage. So our marriages were prearranged and girls were promised at birth by our elders. And they would marry a man who was generally five to 10 years older than them because it took men a little longer to develop the maturity um, and the skills to be able to take on a wife and children as well as contribute to society. Now, of course, I remember asking my elders, why would you marry a girl um, off to someone so far away from her own family? And the elders explained it in two simple reasons. One, it took two families, brought them together to be one family, and two, so it stopped interbreeding and, and spread the gene pool further. So we never married in our own language group, we always married outside. Today, obviously, that practice is no longer um, around and we are free to marry whoever we like, but in traditional times, that was the whole purpose, was to, to spread the gene pool and to make sure that we didn't have interbreeding in our uh, communities. The trading areas that we would meet with when we went along those red song lines vary in, in location. Ballarat though was a trading area, so Lake Wendery was a place that people would come to and sit down and trade in. In fact, Loretto College is actually built on a sacred corroboree ground, so it has two significance, one being a Catholic girls' school and the other being a sacred Wathaurong well, corroboree ground. But the reason for meeting at Lake Wendery is because it ha is a large water source and had plenty of food and plant life to sustain our long meetings. So our trading meetings didn't go for a day or an hour. They went for weeks, maybe months, depending on what needed to be discussed. And of course, if you're going to travel all the way from the Kimberley region down here to meet, you don't want to do it for a day. You need to make it a, a worthwhile journey. Hence why the uh, time period. Now here in Australia, we are becoming more and more Aboriginal culture ingrained into our everyday occurrences and so some of the significant ceremonies that are traditional practice in our culture are now being part of every day across uh, organisations and schools and so forth. One of them is called a welcome to country. Now a welcome to country is a small ceremony that would have traditionally been performed by elders of the language group whose land you were gathering on or who you were visiting. So, for example, if you were a different language group coming here to Wadarong country, you would wait on the boundary area of Wadarong country, you would uh, set up a small campfire so that someone could see that you were camped there and wait for Wadarong to come out and meet you. The elders would come out to greet you, they would perform a dance, uh, sing a song and make a small speech, as well as provide you with a smoking ceremony. The smoking ceremony would be conducted in that small wooden bowl, which is down in the bottom right hand corner, and that's called a coolerman. And we would burn native plant matter uh, to create a thick, white, dense smoke. That would be waved over participants, and the purpose of this whole ceremony is to free your body of any evil spirits and negativity and to offer you safe passage across the land. You can akin it to today when we travel, we get a stamp in our passport to say that we can enter into a country and that's what a welcome to country would have been back in the day. Today we do it at large gatherings. So things like uh, we see it in the Dreamtime AFL rounds and in the NRL, you might attend conferences where they hold a welcome to country, the opening of buildings and so forth. And once again, I reiterate that it can only be conducted by an elder of the language group whose land you are gathered on. An acknowledgement to country can be conducted by anyone and this is purely a way in which we can raise awareness of Aboriginal culture and grow in the respect of the heritage and the ongoing relationship to traditional custodians. An acknowledgement to country comes in the form of, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the land of the Wathaurong people and I wish to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. As I mentioned, it can be conducted by anyone. So it doesn't just have to be an Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander person. It can be said by any person in a small gathering. So an acknowledgement to country generally occurs at staff meetings, assemblies and so forth. And it should become a regular occurrence. It shouldn't be tokenistic, but it should be said with meaning so that we can integrate the importance of Aboriginal culture into our everyday society. 
And a smoking ceremony, as I mentioned before, occurs in a welcome to country, but we also have it at the birth of our babies and when someone dies. So it's part of a three part system in our life cycle. We believe that we come from the dream time and when we enter in from the past and when we enter into the present in human form, we have a smoking ceremony to ensure that the spirit of that person moves from the dream time into the present. Then we live here as human beings and custodians for this land. And then when we die, we have another smoking ceremony to ensure that the spirit of that person moves from this world to the next, where they will become a spiritual ancestor. And I'll explain that a little more later on. So a smoking ceremony is quite significant in our culture. The dream time or the dreaming is our identity. It's the name of our spirituality or our religion. And it's our cultural teaching and it teaches us everything about the world around us, about our lives and how it integrates into everything that we do. And it gives us an understanding of who we are and where we come from. And it's done through stories, dance, song and artwork. So we are an oral culture. Um, and so nothing was written down. The only records that we now have in, in current times is due to universities and European people recording what they've learned from Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people. Kinship. Kinship is the definition of our family structure. So our families run very similar to that of mainstream society, but then they have a slight twist, which gives us multiple uh, roles and responsibilities in our communities. Today, because we don't just live in our own community, but we live spread out across Australia and the world, kinship defines our roles and responsibilities for the raising and educating of children and also to the elderly. So in the next slide, I'm gonna try and explain this to you. Uh, and see how we go following along. But I'll refer to colour uh, as well so that we can easily follow this explanation. All right, we're gonna start in the green. We've got a mother and a father and they have a son and a daughter for this example. Now on the left hand side, mum has a brother and a sister and her parents. In mainstream society, as in our own, mum's brother and sister would be known as an auntie and an uncle to those green children. So in the red there, we've got auntie slash mother and uncle. So we're just gonna focus on the mainstream names first. So they would be known as an auntie and uncle to the green children, and then mum's parents would be known as grandparents to the green children. The same on dad's side of the family. His brother and sister would be known as an auntie and uncle to the green children, and his parents would be known as grandparents to the green children. Now the slight twist that occurs in kinship is that any adult on the biological parent's side of the family that is the same gender as that parent, so hence on mum's side of the family, any adult female, not only has their mainstream name wrong, but they also become a parent to those green children. So now mum's sister, who is known as an auntie to the green children, also becomes a mother and the grandmother is a mother. So now those green children have their biological mother and two other mothers on that side of the family. Because the uncle and pa are not the same gender as mum, they don't have any parental responsibility over the green children. Any offspring of the auntie or the uncle, depending on their role, would define the role of those cousins. So when it comes to mum's side of the family, the auntie mother, if you go down below in the purple, her children are not only known as cousins to the green children, but they also become siblings because of her parenting. So now they have a cousin brother and a cousin sister in the purple. Because the uncle does not have any parental responsibility on that side of the family, his children in the orange are only known as cousins to the green children, not siblings. On the other side, on dad's side of the family, all adult males take parental responsibility over the children. So now those children have uncle fathers and grandfathers. Therefore, in this example, they've got three fathers. And the uncle father's children on that side of the family in the purple become cousin siblings. So in my family, if my mother was Indigenous, she has two older brothers. They don't have any parental responsibility to me because they're not the same gender as my mum and their children are only known as cousins 
because my uncles don't have any parental responsibility. On my dad's side of the family, on the Indigenous side of our um, family, he is the youngest of four boys. So I have him and three older uncles. Those three older uncles are also known as my fathers. So I have four fathers. And when it comes to siblings, I have a biological younger brother, but I also have seven older cousin brothers and five older cousin sisters. So according to kinship, I come from a family of 13 siblings, but mainstream society only recognises one. Here in the medical field, we need to understand that this kinship system can run quite strongly for some Aboriginal people. And therefore, when it comes to providing a medical service to children, we need to always ask the adult that's with them, are you the legal guardian of this child? Because if I had one of my kinship children coming in with me into hospital and you didn't know me, some of the younger ones call me mum. So you would just assume that I'm their mother but I don't have any legal right to sign off on any medical intervention. So we need to always be asking, are you the legal guardian of this child? Just to make sure we cover ourselves. Now to take this one step further and probably confuse you even more, I mentioned before about the three part life system that we have. So we come from the dreaming, we live in the present as a human being and we leave this world and become a spiritual ancestor. Now for every group, they have an overarching totem, which is their creator God. And then for some language groups, we have individual totems that link us into the dreaming and our life cycle. So in Yorta Yorta, we're given individual totems, which are native Australian animals. When I was two and a half, my elders watched me and looked at my personality traits and my interactions with others, and they deemed that I would be an echidna. They said I was cute, but spiky. Probably a little less cute now, but more spiky. And the whole purpose of being an echidna is that I plod along in life. Nothing really phases me too much, but when I feel under threat or stress or pressure, I will burrow down and put my cools up like an echidna. Now I have a past and the creation story of this animal and how it came to be. I have a present as a human being and a custodian for this land. And I know that as part of my spirituality, if I see or dream of an echidna going about its daily business, it's a sign that my spiritual ancestors are watching over me. I also know that if I see or dream of an echidna that has died of natural causes, then it's a sign that my time on this earth is gonna to come to an end very soon. And then I will die and my spirit will return in the form of an echidna and be the spiritual guide and ancestor for the next generation. Now, when it comes to kinship, that totem is also linked into this structure. So there are women in my community who are also echidnas, and if they're roughly about 10 years older or 10 years younger than me, they are my sisters. We are not biologically related, but we are kinship related. And therefore under kinship, their children are my children and my children are their children. So last count, I've got 223 children that I care for. And we don't do birthdays and we don't do Christmas, but we do have that responsibility of being a parent if required. We also know that unfortunately, we have a high rate of children in out of home care. And we are fortunate enough that Child Protection actually use this model to search for a placement for children needing to be removed from their parents. So kinship does actually work in that sense. Unfortunately, in mainstream society though, it doesn't work as well as it should. And there are many historical uh, policies and procedures that have impacted on that, which I will get to. Please, if you find this extremely confusing, you can contact me and I will try and take you through it again. But I hope that was about as clear as mud for you as well. All right, now in history, there have been missions and reserves set up for Aboriginal people. So in the mid 1800s, this is one of the policies and procedures that started to fracture our community. We saw an influx of Europeans arriving here to Australia to find their fortune. Once the prisoner era had finished, then we opened up our lands here in Australia to free settlers. Free settlers coming in to settle in this country started to spread out and Aboriginal people were pushed further and further onto the fringes of society. Now in the mid 1800s, it became apparent to the Victorian government that there was an issue between European settlers and Aboriginal people. Uh, and so they decided to set up a central board of protection for Aborigines in 1860. 
Now, the whole point of this Aboriginal Protection Board was to gather Aboriginal people up and to place them on um, Crown land uh, where they were ruled by a government official and they had to live on this farming land and remain there as a safety precaution against mainstream society. Now, we need to know that from 1788 until 1967, Aboriginal people actually fell under the Flora and Fauna Act. So when the first fleet arrived and settled into this country, uh, they declared this land terra nullius, which meant it was an uninhabited land. And that totally disregarded uh, the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were already here. So to fit into their policies and procedures, they placed us under the Flora and Fauna Act, which meant we had the same rights as the native animals and plants. In fact, in 1962, the Queensland government released a pamphlet out to its citizens to say that if you came across an injured Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander person and you wanted to render assistance, you were advised to bundle us up into the back of your transport and drop us off to the local veterinarian or wildlife reserve to have our health needs met. We are fortunate that in 1967, Australia held a referendum where 98.99% of the population voted that we should be classed as human beings in this country and counted on the census. So when it came to these missions and reserves in 1860, they were just herding up flora and fauna and placing them where they thought it was best. We weren't allowed to leave these missions and reserves. We had to seek permission that wasn't very, uh, wasn't given quite freely, I should say. And the whole point is coming onto these missions and reserves that we denounced our Aboriginality and that we lived in a civilised manner and that we practised Christianity and that we were educated in European society. Now, we still have people today in our communities that were raised on these missions and reserves. We still have family members and community members that went through that flora and fauna era. So I know that my grandmother and my great grandmother lived not only all of their life or majority of their life under that flora and fauna era. My dad was born in 1957, so for the first 10 years of his life, he was classed as flora and fauna. In fact, some people were issued with a birth certificate that declared them as flora and fauna. And then in 1967, when the referendum occurred, that was changed over. So this has great impact on our communities and our society uh, and makes it quite difficult for us to trust the outside world. As you can see on these maps, there are the main missions and reserves there around our state. And you speak to any of our elders and they'll tell you that they were probably born and raised on some of those missions and reserves. The unfortunate part of also of these missions and reserves is that you weren't necessarily placed on them with your family. So where there was a spare spot, you were put. So you could be separated from your family members and your community, which caused further fracturing of our culture and our family practices. Then came along the next policy and procedure in, after the 1860s in the early 1900s, which we now call the Stolen Generation, but was previously known as the Half-Caste Policy. The governments became increasingly aware that there were becoming more and more children born on these missions and reserves of lighter coloured skin, and this became an issue to them. So the government still stands strong to the thought that between 1910 and 1970, they forcibly removed 100,000 Aboriginal children from the care of their families. What the government gave was free reign to welfare officers to go into the missions and reserves and remove these lighter coloured skin children. Now back in the day, welfare officers had free range. We now know them as social workers, hence why there seems to be a slight barrier between Aboriginal people and social workers and a bit of distrust still today. So the welfare officers could come in, they would line up the children. They had a skin tone card like a paint card. When you go to hardware store, you can see a paint strip card that shows you full strength, half strength, quarter strength of a colour very similar to the skin tone card. They would hold it up against the children and they would determine which children had lighter coloured skin and which had the darker ones. Only lighter coloured skin children in the early years were removed and they were either adopted out to white families or placed in orphanages. As the years went on, it became any child of Aboriginal heritage was forcibly removed from the care of their parents. 
Now schools played a part in this. You might drop your child off to school today and go back and get them this afternoon and they're not there. Your child more likely told that you had died or didn't want them anymore and you were never told where to find your child again. Police assisted in the removal of children and hospitals played a part. So women coming to birth their children had them removed at birth or if you came to seek medical intervention uh, for your child, then it was removed from your care. Most children removed were under the age of five, but gradually the age became older and older, all the way up to 12 years of age. The main point of this was to try and assimilate Aboriginal children into mainstream society. And I don't know how many of you have actually seen the film Rabbit Proof Fence, but there's a character in that called A.O. Neville. And he was actually in real life, the chief protector of Aboriginal people in Western Australia. He put a theory out across the country that the lighter coloured skinned children had the most intelligence. And therefore, if we removed them from their Aboriginal families, we could assimilate them effectively into white society. He then hoped that by assimilating them into white society, that we would then breed with other white people and eventually breed out the dark skinned Aboriginal person. So my personal opinion, and take it as you will, but I like to akin that very similar to that of Hitler. So breeding out someone for your own gain um, is totally deplorable. Now we know that there are more and more evidence coming out that children were being removed up until the 1980s. Um, and so this stolen generation affects two to three generations of our community and our people. You'll be hard pressed to find an Aboriginal family that doesn't have a stolen generation or multiple stolen generation members. My grandmother was removed at the age of five, taken from her family in Maroopna and brought down to Melbourne. Uh, and she was placed in an orphanage and she was raised there until she was 15. Research coming out from psychiatrists and psychologists and so forth, telling us that Aboriginal children raised in these institutions, unfortunately many suffered at the hands of those who were meant to be caring for them. They suffered physical, sexual and mental abuse and my grandmother suffered all three. When she was removed or sent out from the orphanage at 15, she had been trained to be a domestic servant, as most girls were, and boys were trained to be manual labourers. Now they say that most of the girls coming out of these institutions come out with personality traits, sorry, that are meek, mild and subservient, and she followed suit. And she met my grandfather not long after that, who was a white Australian truck driver, and unfortunately she fell pregnant to him. Now her employees forced them to be married as it was done in the day and uh, they moved to Ballarat and raised their family here. Their marriage was fraught with domestic violence. Um, my grandmother used alcohol as a way of stemming her demons and she suffered all the symptoms of this trauma that we see in this cycle here. So she suffered isolation from the very top in the green. She suffered isolation from her community, from her family, who she never saw again, and she actually isolated herself from society because she wasn't accepted. She feared the dominant culture, so she had a big discomfort with the dominant culture, and she used to tell my uncle fathers that they needed to be shadow people, that they needed to hide from mainstream society because uh, otherwise there would always be a negative consequence for them. She had difficulties in parenting, because she'd been raised in an institution, she'd never had a role model on how to parent effectively. Uh, and so there were difficulties in the way in which she parented. Uh, she had an inability to manage relationships. My dad will constantly tells us that he had never heard his mum say that she loved them. She showed them, but she could never say the words herself because she'd never heard it uh, for so many years and didn't know what it meant really. Shame, shame is big in our community. We use shame as a disciplinary tool. So if you break the rules, we'll shame and shun you for a short amount of time and then we bring you back in. But for the stolen generation, the shame is about what has happened to them. Why did it happen to them and why didn't anyone come and save them? Fear and distrust of anyone outside the Aboriginal community or your immediate family impacts on everyday life. Criminal offences are rife and I know that I've sat down with the elders here in the Ballarat community who majority of them are stolen generation and they said the reason why many turn to criminal offences is because their lack of education and employment opportunities, they turn to criminal offences to supplement their wage and then for some of them 
being placed into prison was being placed back into an institutionalised arena that they already knew well and it made them feel safe. Uh, substance abuse is rife in our community. So as I mentioned, my grandmother was an alcoholic. That was her self-medicating tool. Others use marijuana. We call it ganja or yandi. And unfortunately, as across society, we're seeing an increase in ice and heroin use as well. Uh, violence and suicide is prevalent in our communities. We know from the research into stolen generation that they say that most of our stolen generation people will react with violence and aggression to stressful situations because that's what they've been taught when they've been raised in those institutions when anything of that nature has occurred. Suicide is prevalent due to the mental health trauma. We know that there are uh, strong um, mental health illnesses in our community and depression is rife as well. And we have a loss of cultural affiliation in our communities. It's humbling as an Aboriginal woman to teach elders about their culture, but it also saddens me because our cultural practice is that they should be teaching me. Now, in my family, my grandparents separated when my dad was nine, he's the youngest. Not long after that, she had a nervous breakdown uh, and she spent the rest of her days in Lakeside, which was the Ballarat Mental Asylum here. Lots of patients in Lakeside at the time were of Aboriginal heritage and some of the elders here who were stolen generation remember my grandmother in that institution. So this cycle of trauma, these symptoms of trauma, impact not only on the original stolen generation members, but we also know that there is transgenerational trauma. So this trauma is passed down from generation to generation in families and it makes it quite difficult for us to engage in mainstream society because of the fear of the negative impact that it will have. So you need to be aware that every patient of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descendancy that walks into this institution comes with the barrier of historical trauma. They come with a discomfort of engaging with you. They are frightened and they are scared and we need to work extra hard as a service to ensure that we are culturally safe and appropriate when they enter in. So in regards to closing the gap uh, with Aboriginal people and ensuring that they feel more engaged and respected in society, the government has many initiatives that it has created to assist. One of the main ones, hence the name, Closing the Gap, was uh, created in March of 2008 between the Australian government and Aboriginal people to assist in working together to achieve equality in health status and life expectancy. Now, there are set targets in this Closing the Gap from 2008, and as you can see on this slide, there are only two of them that are on track. And this is meant to all be achieved by 2030. So we will see whether how well we can go about this. And you can actually Google some of these if you wish. I don't need to go through this entire slide. Um, you can read through this, but this is just to give you an idea of some of the things that the government has initiated to help work towards closing the gap and ensuring Aboriginal people are sitting on an equal footing with the rest of society that makes it equitable for everyone. Some of the other initiatives on this slide are also shown. So the primary health care Organisations are more about Aboriginal community controlled health organisations such as ACHOs. We have one here in Ballarat called the Ballarat and District Aboriginal Cooperative, which is commonly referred to as BADAC. That is down behind the library on the corner of Market and Armstrong Street. And BADAC is like a one-stop shop for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members. So we don't, not only provides a medical GP clinic, but it also provides uh, assistance with housing and justice and family and social and emotional well-being. And some Aboriginal people in our community here in Ballarat will access those ACHOs and some will choose to go mainstream. So we need to remember that we don't always, when we're referring out, um, refer straight to BADAC. We need to engage in a conversation with the individual to see where they would like to go. But just to make you aware that that is out there. Now, there's also Closing the Gap scripts available in society, PBS. So these are like the PBS scheme, but specifically for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people. And it runs very similar to the PBS scheme. So if you are on a government benefit or welfare payment, 
your particular medications will be for free and if you are not then you can have your scripts at a lower cost. This is to ensure that Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people actually take their medication. So this provides no barrier to them being able to adhere to um, a medical regime. We are very fortunate that here in the hospital, the hospital covers all in-house scripts for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander patients. So all you need to do if you are writing out a script for one of our patients is to write CTG on the top of it and pharmacy here will know exactly what they need to do with that. There are things like vaccinations, integrated team care, AOD and family violence, and obviously ongoing research to help improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lives and their health status. Core principles when working with Aboriginal patients, you can take the time to read through these and give you an idea of, of how best to approach your work practice. But in discussing with our elders, some of the key ones that they wanted me to share with you are in the following slide. So some handy tips. They gave me nine and I told them I didn't have the time to go through nine, but I asked them to give me top five that they really would like me to share with you. And so those ones are in the orange. One is no eye contact is a sign of respect. So in our society, anyone that we deem in a leadership role, an elder or so forth, has no eye contact and we're showing them the utmost respect. So that's a cultural practice. So when someone comes into the hospital of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent and they do not make eye contact with you during you know, clinical moment, that is not because they're being disrespectful and not because they're being shifty or shady as would be perceived in mainstream society. What it is, is that they are showing you the utmost respect. Now, if you're dealing with that patient over a progression of time, eventually eye contact will be made. But initially, that no eye contact is showing you the utmost respect. The second one they asked me to make sure that I tell you is be aware of your body language. So we can have a whole conversation without saying a word. So we are very attuned to your body language. The way in which you present in the initial meeting is the way in which generally we can sum you up. So you need to make sure that your body language is open and friendly and engaging so that we feel safe and respected in, in our communications with you. Third one is respect the use of silence. We ask a lot of questions in the healthcare system and we ask a lot of in-depth personal questions. Uh, and most of our patients coming into this service will be hypervigilant. They will be anxious and scared, and so they're not thinking clearly. When we ask an in-depth question, elders have asked you to wait for a response, not to roll on and ask the next question straight away. This isn't meant to be a Spanish inquisition. We are meant to be working together as a, in a partnership. So what they're asking is that you ask an in-depth question, you wait, give time for the patient to think about their response, and then once they've answered, then move on. It's just a way of lowering that anxiety um, in the whole interaction. The other thing is to understand that agreement and yes responses are a learnt behaviour. So we have learnt from our stolen generation just to say yes doesn't matter what it is, just say yes, because that will then prevent any negative consequence. If we disagree, question you or say no, then we may have a negative consequence. That's our belief and that's our um, pretty much our training from our stolen generation. So if a patient automatically responds yes and agrees, our advice is that you ask the question again, reword it, to see if you get the same response or ask the patient to repeat back what they've understood so that you can fully ascertain whether that is a yes in an agreement response. Um, and the last one is do not take distrust personally. It is not you, it is the historical impact of the organisation that it has had on our communities. And the barrier is there, but we do try and break it down as best we can in our own community, but we need your understanding as well. And just to take the time and be patient-centred in the care that you provide goes a long way to breaking down that barrier. Now, remember, you have here at Ballarat Health Services an Aboriginal health team. 
and we are here to provide, as it displays in this little picture here, cultural, emotional and spiritual and clinical support to patients and their families. We are here to provide patient advocacy. We are also there for cultural consultation with clinicians. We can participate in family meetings. We will support discharge planning and we will do community follow-up. We are like the bridge between the two. We're here to help our community, but we're also here to help you. So please reach out and ask us to assist. We should be involved in MDMs and on-ward meetings and so forth in regards to our patients. But first and foremost, you need to make sure that you ask the patient whether they agree to having an ARLO, an Aboriginal Hospital Liaison Officer involved in their care. But give us a call, we're happy to help. And here is our contact details. So please reach out to us, we're here to help you and we're here to help them. We work Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 5pm. Thank you.